Welcome to day 47 of our scripture reading and daily encouragement. Today we're going to cover Numbers chapters 8, 9, and 10. And we're going to cover Mark chapter 5. We're going to finish up that chapter by covering verses 21 through 43. So as we pick up in Numbers, God has given them all of his instructions. Now they're simply implementing the instructions. And we see here that a year had passed from the original Passover, and they got to celebrate their second Passover, uh, but first in the wilderness. So the first one to comm commemorate what had happened being delivered out of Egypt. Then we see the fiery cloud, the flowery, fiery cloud, which is the Lord's presence, covers the tabernacle. And when it lifted, it says they broke camp and followed. When it stopped, that's where they set up camp. And what we see here is God had a very specific plan. Very specific plan of how they would travel through the wilderness, how they would, you know, how many days they would travel at a time, what direction they would go. And basically, he was just testing his people to see, would they obey him? And would they be patient? Remember, he's trying to get that slavery mentality out of them that they had born and bred into them for the past 400 years. And he's testing them to be a set-apart people. Will you follow all these commands that I've set up? And when we move, will you obey me and go with me? Will you be patient? Um, because sometimes they were moving daily, it says. Sometimes they were moving weekly. Sometimes they might set up for a month. So there are different periods of time. And I'm just thinking about, man, there were over 600,000 people that left Egypt. And by this point, they must have grown some. And we know when they took that first census um, early in numbers, they had grown, and that's just counting the men. So easily it could be a couple of million people that had to move each time. I mean, what kind of coordination would that take? So we look and see why did God, why was God so specific on these rules? But he had to be specific to have the order it would take for a couple of million people to just pick up on a daily basis and move. That would be almost impossible in today's time. Think about how difficult that would have been back then. But there's a little small couple of scriptures here that we sometimes just gloss over. We see Moses begging his brother-in-law to stay with them. Moses' brother-in-law was not an Israelite, but Moses was saying, stay with us. Stay with us and do what we do. Follow these same laws and you'll get the same blessing of going into the promised land, the same blessing, blessing of the Israelites and it says Moses' brother-in-law didn't want that. He wanted to return to his land. And I'm just thinking, the miracles this man has seen. The Red Sea was parted. Pharaoh's army destroyed. Oh, not to mention all the plagues that had happened. Oh, not to mention that manna had dropped from heaven and they always had water. They had food, water, protection. They're seeing this fiery cloud pick up and move. Yet this man says, I don't want any part of that. And I think we have to realize that there will be people in our lives that we will try to show Jesus to, that we will try to talk to God about. And it doesn't make sense to us that they don't want that. But their hearts have been hardened and they just don't want it. And sometimes we spend so much time worrying about those people and investing in those people that we miss other opportunities. So I want to take an opportunity to invest in everyone God puts in my path, but I have to have discernment and wisdom from God to know when that person just doesn't want it and I need to move on. So we need to pray. I want to encourage you this morning that we need to pray for that discernment. We need to pray for that knowledge that we will know who we need to invest in and who just doesn't want it and we need to move on. As Jesus said in Matthew, sometimes we're throwing our pearls in front of pigs and we need that discernment from God not to do that. Okay, as we go over into Mark, we see once again, Jesus can't go anywhere without drawing a, lo a large crowd. He gets in a boat, goes across the lake. Who's waiting on him? Large crowd. But we see the leader of the local synagogue, Jairus. <clears throat> he comes to Jesus and he says, my daughter is dying. Please come help her. But as they're going and they're traveling, this, wo this woman appears on the scene and says she's been bleeding for 12 years. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. We can only think in our days, our, our terms of today, and how difficult that must have been on her body or that inconvenience for her. But you got to think back. At this time, we've just gone through all these purification things in the Old Testament, all these rules. And if you remember, 
if you read this with us, if you remember a woman when she was bleeding, when she was having her, her period, she was ceremonial, ceremonially unclean. So that restricted what she could do with the body, the body of the Israelites, the body of, the, of God's chosen people. It, it restricted what she could participate in. So you've got this woman that she's been bleeding for 12 years. So don't think of it just as a physical handicap. She's been essentially cut off from the people of God for 12 years. This is so much bigger than just a physical handicap or an inconvenience or what it's done to her body. This has cut her off and made her unclean. So she is desperate for help. And she says, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. And she does, and she's healed instantly, and she knows it, she feels it. But then Jesus turns and says, who touched my robe? And it says she was frightened. She was healed, but she was frightened. But she did admit to him and bow before him. And he said, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. See, she thought she was going to get in trouble. But she had so much faith, she was desperate. And I think sometimes we got to be desperate. We got to be desperate from a touch for Jesus. We got to be desperate for his healing. And when we're desperate and we have faith and we just get to the point where we can touch his robe, that's when our faith will make us well. We have to have that faith to be healed. So about this time, someone shows up from Jairus' house and says, Oh, you're too late. Took you too long. His daughter's dead. And Jesus says, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. So this part of this chapter is about having faith for your healing. Jesus gets to the house and everybody's, there's a bunch of commotion. Everybody's crying and mourning. And he says, why all the commotion and weeping? This girl's not dead. She's just sleeping. And it says the crowds laughed at him. See, they didn't have faith. So he made them stay outside. If you don't have faith, you stay outside. And he only took a few of his disciples and the girl's parents in. Because see, in the natural, she was dead. She was dead, and this made no sense to them. Oh, this man's foolish. He thinks that she's just asleep. But Jesus is supernatural, not natural. He walks in. He holds her hand, and he says, Little girl, get up. And she did, and she was healed. She went from dead to raised from the dead. See, a lot of Jesus' miracles were about healing people. There were miracles, but this took it a step farther. This girl needed healed, but before Jesus could get there, she dies but he raises her from the dead. And what I want to encourage you with is we live in a world where Christians don't believe in the healing power of Jesus anymore. But that's what Mark is focusing on here. Why would Mark focus so much on the healing power of Jesus if it wasn't for us today? Why would this be laid out and just be a disappointment because we don't have access to this power today? I want to read John 14, 12. I know I'm, I'm getting out of our normal reading, but this is crucial. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. Wow. Why? Because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can be to the Father. Ask for anything in my name and I will do it so the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask for anything in my name and I will do it. This is critical, guys. Jesus is showing us, whether we're hearing the account in Mark or the account in John, our faith is extremely important for our healing. We have this authority given it to us as believers in Jesus. Don't let anyone tell you that's not for you today. We had a young girl in our congregation that we were praying over for healing a few weeks ago. And when we brought her up to pray over her, I asked faithful pre people to come forward and pray. And I said, if you are in this room and you have any doubt of the miraculous power of Jesus' healing, get out of the room. And that may have sounded harsh, but I was essentially doing exactly what Jesus did. If you're going to laugh at Jesus' healing power and say it's not for today, then get out of my room because I don't want your lack of faith in here. We have to have that faith. Our healing is dependent upon our faith, and I can't stress that enough. 
So I want you to gain encouragement today if you're suffering mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Have faith and Jesus can heal you. You just got to have enough faith to struggle through the crowd and touch his robe. A little perseverance, a little desperation, and a whole lot of faith and you will be healed. I hope you're encouraged today and I hope you have a great day.